Bible says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. In Romans chapter 11, verse 28, there's two key words, gospel and then election. When we went through the book of Romans, all the way through chapters 1, all the way through chapter number 8, we saw the gospel clearly laid out. Uh, three times from chapters 1 through 8, we see through faith. Six times we see by faith. Fourteen times within those eight chapters, we see the word grace. And 25 times we see the word righteousness. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And that is how individual souls are redeemed by God. Go to Ephesians chapter number 1 as we start to unpack this idea of election and the gospel. Let's start in Ephesians 1. When we see words in the Bible, we have to run the references for all of the words found. And then we have to get the context of which it's refer those words are referring to. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1. The Bible says in verse number 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So as a believer, that's what we are promised. Not material blessings, spiritual not in earthly places, but in heavenly. So where's our treasure? Where should it be laid up in? Heaven. And our heavenly place is in Christ. And now it says in verse number four, according as he hath chosen us before the foundation of the world. Now, if you look at your text, I read it wrong on purpose to draw out the point. What two words did I leave out? In him. Those are two key words. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So unless you are found in him, then nobody can have eternal life. The only way somebody can have eternal life is if they are found in Christ. And guess where you and I never were before the foundation of the world? We were never in Christ. We were never in Him. So it would be impossible for somebody that is living today or in times past on this earth it would be impossible for them to be saved or in Christ before the foundation of the world because nobody ever was. Now, you also can't be elect as an individual unless you are found in Him. You have to be in God's elect before you can be called elect. It doesn't work the other way around. You can't say, I'm elect, and now I'm in Christ. It has to be, I am in Christ, therefore, now I can claim my individual election. And by the way, our individual election is only based upon the corporate election of being in Christ and being in His body. And when you draw that lens back, you see the body of Christ, that body is elect, Christ the head is elect, and all of us that are in His body now can say we are elect. But until that happens, none of us are before the foundation of the world. <laughs> okay? Um. Look at verse uh, 
We'll go to 1 Peter 2 as our next text. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. First Peter two, verse number six. Look at the reference here. It says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Who is this very clearly referencing? Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the chief cornerstone. He's precious. He's elect. Jesus Christ is the reference to who is elect in 1 Peter. Now look at chapter 1 of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 1. I look at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Verse number 2. Elect according to something. It's according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now, the sanctification of the Spirit and the sprinkling of the blood, did that happen before the foundation of the world? No. Christ's blood wasn't shed until He was alive on the earth after 33 and a half years. And then you had blood. <laughs> the precious blood of the elect one that we saw in chapter 2. Precious, elect, chief cornerstone. He didn't shed his precious blood until Calvary's tree. So, you, until you have that happen, you can't have any individual be considered elect. Because no one was in Christ until Christ shed his blood. Well, what happened to all the those that died in faith prior to that. That's a whole nother lesson and we go down that trail, we'll never get done this lesson. But the short and long, the long and short of it was they didn't go to heaven. They went to paradise and they were in Abraham's bosom. In other words, the care of Father Abraham. After the blood was shed and sprinkled on the mercy seat and all of that, then captivity was led captive and now so you could have access to the Father because Christ accomplished what was needed. But until all that happened, nobody could be in Christ who was the elect. Okay? Nobody before the foundation of the world individually was elect except one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. We know that from John 1, right? He created all things. So He was there before the foundation of the world because He's an eternal God. Now, go to Romans 8. Go to Romans 8. We're going to get back to Romans 11 in a minute, but I want to lay some groundwork on defining and understanding context of election. Romans chapter number 8, look at verse number 31. Romans 8, 31. What shall we say, well, I'm sorry, what shall we then say to those things, to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Now, if you were elect before the foundation of the world, you would have no need to be put in Christ. 
because you would, you would have already been in him before the foundation of the world, and therefore you would not have even need to have been saved. But you weren't in him before the foundation of the world. The other thing is, if you were elect before the foundation of the world, then there would be nothing that could be laid to your charge. But guess what? When you were born and, and you were conceived in sin and you lived your life as a sinner, guess what? There is a lot to be laid to your charge. <laughs> There's a lot to be laid to my charge. I wasn't elected before the foundation of the world. If I was, what does is, what is, what is verse number 33 say? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? All I have to say is, look, I don't need to be saved. I'm elect. Nothing can be laid to my charge. I was saved before the foundation of the world. This is why it's dangerous if you ever hear someone say they're trusting in their election. You have to trust in Christ. You will be placed in the elect. And now you can say you are elect. And that's an important distinction to make. We were at enmity with God. I mean, we're just God hating, blaspheming, just going down the line with all the crimes that you and I committed against God before we were, before we were saved. So until you've been placed in Christ, until you've been put in Him, everything is laid against you. <laughs> Every single charge out there is against you and against me. Praise God that He saved us. Now look at verse, okay, so stay in Romans 8. Now look at verse number 17. Romans 8, 17. And if children, you're a child of God, if you've trusted Christ, you're his child. Praise the Lord. And if children, then heirs, heirs with God, and joint heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, we're still in Romans 8, verse 17. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Full glorification has not happened. Verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, right now, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And Romans 8 talks about our soul's salvation is complete, but the glorification of our body isn't. So our salvation becomes fully complete once we receive a glorified body and we are with the Lord forever. That only happens to those who are in the elect. And Romans 8 gives a picture of what the future will be. And by the way, that is going to be the same for all of us. You just say, man, how in the world can God make me something that's glorified? <laughs> that's the point. God can. I can't do it for me. You can't do it for you. But God can do it because we are in him as the elect. That's a future look, right? Everybody see that? That glorified body that's coming. Is God an eternal God? Was he around before the foundation of the world? So not only is right now you're in Christ, and not only in the future, you go forward in the future for eternity, but you also now go backward in the future, or backward in the past, for eternity past, which would put you, if you're in Christ, you can, you can definitively say you're in an eternal God. You have all the blessings going in eternity past. You have all the blessings going in eternity future. You're in Christ. Don't get any better than that. Okay. Colossians 3, look at this verse. Colossians 3, concerning election. Verse 
All right, we'll read this verse, and I'm going to ask you a question or two, and I want you to I want you to give me the answer. It'll be an easy question. All right, Colossians 3, actually we'll start reading at 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And praise the Lord. We got a comment from someone who uh, watches uh, one of our onliners that watches and uh, saw one of our, our posts, our pictures, and said, uh, man, I really love the diversity in your group. You know what that is? That's this verse. We're all in Christ. It doesn't matter if you're a Greek or a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a Mexican or Italian. None of that matters. What matters is, are you in Christ? Okay? So, first question. Who is this referencing to? Believers or unbelievers? Believers. believers, right, believers. Okay, so now, let's read verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. So, as believers, we are told to put on something and we're referred to as the elect of God. So, when you see ele this elect of God in Colossians 3, is this how to be saved? Or is this how to live if you are already saved? It's how to live if you're already saved. That's right. So how do you live if you're already saved? Holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Did Christ forgive you? Okay, you're in Christ, I'm in Christ. Let's, ha let, can we do that? <laughs> you know, the, the saying, you know, you do you. How about we do Christ? <laughs> How about we live like Christ? Humbleness, kindness. If you are elect, God says you are to be something. These things we just read. And as individual Christians, we ought to really get a hold of that. All right, now let's go back to Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter number 11. Because we see this word show up and it says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Now, because of everything that we just read, this can't possibly be referring to individual Christians as the elect. It certainly can't be referring to Christ as the elect. So who is it referring to? National Israel. That's what the parentheses of Romans 9, 10, and 11 is to deal with. The national entity of Israel. And God says, look at verse 14 in Romans 11. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. We preached on this verse rather extensively. There is still hope for individual Jews. And Paul hopes that an individual Jew, his fellow kinsman according to the flesh, would see and hear how he's ministering to Gentiles. And that they would then, his, his fellow kinsmen would then hear the gospel, believe the gospel, and be saved individually. That's what Paul's hope is, that some would be saved, those individual Jews right now. But in verse number 28, it says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Who is the enemy? National Israel is the enemy of the gospel. The entire nation has gone apostate. 
They're enemies of the gospel. They put Christ on the cross. But at the same time that they are enemies of the gospel, they are elect according to God's national plan for them. Does that make sense? They are national Israel right now. They are two things at the same time. They are enemies of the gospel, but at the same time, it is God's elect nation. And because God elected that nation to some covenant promises, they are beloved for the Father's sake because He has elected them and that is not going to change. But concerning the gospel right now, they are absolutely enemies. That's why verse 14 Paul's hope and desire is that some would be saved. See how he ministers to the Gentiles. They hear and they believe. Um, look at Romans 5. Romans 5, verse, verse number 10. Might as well back up to verse 8. But God commendeth His love toward us, Romans 5, 8. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's all of us, sinners. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So you and I, we, all of us, everyone in the world, they are absolutely enemies of God. And as an enemy, as a sinner, God loved us enough to die for us. If you've been in the military or you have family or friends that are in the military, my guess is they're in the United States military. So we want them to shoot the enemy. We don't want our troops to get shot. <laughs> no, you, we, we want to shoot down the enemy. We want to win. Because we don't love our enemy. We love our nation. And we're trying to protect ourselves. That's not what Christ did. It's completely flipped. We are Christ's enemies and he came down and took a bullet for us. He died on the cross for us as enemies. There's no greater love. You can't find a picture of greater love than Christ on the cross dying for his enemies and those that hate him are angry with him and are sinners against him. It's the great love of God. But all of us were enemies at one point. If you've trusted him, you've been reconciled. Look at Colossians 1. Colossians 1, and in verse number 21. Uh, back up to verse 20. And, ha and having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and what? Enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled. Do you know before you came to Christ, your entire mind was against God? <laughs> the full being of your intellect. You, you and I had purposeful and deliberate thoughts completely against God. <laughs> Our entire minds, our intellectual faculties, all of it was corrupt. Your, our, our mental muscles, that means our imagination, our memory, our reasoning, our perception, our intuition, and our will, all of it was against God. Wow, that bad? Yeah, that bad. And God shed His blood and died on the cross for us. It'd be a good time to just park there and praise His holy name. Praise God. Praise God. Now, concerning his elect nation, 
We're going to wrap up some thoughts here. Look at Romans 11. Romans 11, look at verse 7. What then, verse 7 in Romans 11, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them, that's the nation of Israel is in, in reference, the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. There was a reason this nation is blinded and it wasn't to just for God to just show off, show off how sovereign he is. It's about the national entity of Israel. And as they're blinded, it goes to the Gentiles. But nationally right now, that nation is rejecting him. And I don't want, and I know you don't want, institutionalized religion where it says, well, God just decreed some to heaven and some to hell. Because all those verses we ran in the beginning, that's not the way it works. John Calvin wrote the institutes of the Christian religion. I don't want institutionalized religion. I don't want franchise religion. I don't want any of that. And you've got to draw a distinction between individual souls being saved and placed in the elect one, Jesus Christ, and national Israel as another entity that God's going to deal with and also references as elect. In verse number 2 of chapter 11, it says, God hath not cast away His people. That's Israel nationally. It says, which He foreknew. He hasn't cast them away. But right now, there's a lot of individual Jews who have rejected Christ and have died and have been cast away. Does that make sense? But nationally, He has not cast away that people. And there's going to come a day when everyone living is going to turn and trust Christ. National Jews as an entity will trust Christ. It's not happening now though. All throughout the ages, people who were that are Jews and have that national descent have completely rejected Christ and they end up in hell the same way a Gentile would. Deuteronomy 70 says, God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the, it's the earth. They're a physical, earthly people. I'll finish up Romans 11. A couple more thoughts and we'll be done. Verse number 29 we'll look at and then we'll... we'll it says in verse number 29, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God's promise to national Israel, it's not going to fail. When you look at Romans 11, verses 28 and 29, you can clearly see that there's an elect group and at the same time they're enemies. They're two different things. The gospel and election are two separate things pictured in Romans 11. And a group of people are shown to be both at the same time. Are you going to get land? You've got a spiritual home in heaven. But that nation's getting land. Because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And God refuses to let his plan for Israel fail. It's not going to fail. God's not changing. What are those gifts? Look at 9, Romans 9. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Romans chapter 9, look at verse 4. The Bible says, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and of whom are concerning the flesh came 
who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. All of that is going to be restored and it's going to be a beautiful time in the millennial kingdom. But God is not going to change what he said he's got for that nation. And then the calling, Israel is called as a holy nation. It's going to be the head of all nations in that millennial kingdom. We'll finish in the book of Isaiah. We've got three spots. Go to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Okay, Isaiah 45, verse, verse number 4. Read the end of verse number 3. We'll start at the, ver uh, at the end of verse 3. The Lord which called thee by thy name am the God of Israel. Verse 4. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine, what? Elect. You can't miss the context. I don't even have to tell you what, who the context is. You know it by reading it. I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. <laughs> that nation is his elect nation. Look at Isaiah 65. Look at verse number 9, Isaiah 65, verse number 9. And I will bring forth, Isaiah 65, verse 9. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it. And my servants shall dwell there. <laughs> It's a seed. It's a physical seed, a physical line of people. It's the national Jewish people. And he calls them mine elect in Isaiah 45 and now in Isaiah 65. And that nation's getting land. God promised it. It's its covenant to them. It's not going to change. We talked about earlier, we receive the spiritual inheritance. National Israel has an earthly inheritance coming to them. Now here's what's real powerful, the last verse, Isaiah 66. Oh, you know, before we go there, stay in Isaiah 65. Look at, um, here's another one. Look at verse 15. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. He's... He, he, that, nation, that nation is chosen. One more is in here. Uh, look at verse 20. Uh, look at verse number 19. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old. But the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build <clears throat> and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, that's the Jewish people, and here it is again, and mine what? Elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth trouble. For they are the seed of that national physical seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. That's all Israel. And they are referred to elect. Last verse and we'll be done. Isaiah 66. Israel so special to God. Look at this verse. Verse 22. Isaiah 66, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain forever. 
That is how beloved that nation is to God. Concerning election, they're beloved for the Father's sake. That means even when the millennial reign, that, that 1,000 years of Christ ruling and reigning as king, even after that, when there's a new heaven and new earth, that nation is beloved. <laughs> verse 22 is a beautiful verse. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. He's going to fully restore that nation to something so glorious we can't even imagine it until we come back to rule and reign with them.